Cecily Harper, you haven't left yet? The secretary came into the office. What are you doing, dear? Go home. It's going to be a long day tomorrow. Why are you so late? I'm waiting for my husband. He promised to give me a ride home from work. But he was delayed, so I'm still here, waiting. I thought you'd gone, but you're still working hard. Cecily smiled sadly. If only Abigail had known that her boss had been staying in the office much longer, she would have had a heart attack. Yes, you're right. It's time to go home. Cecily got up from her table and walked over to the mirror. She hated going home, and no one was waiting for her. But she was ashamed to admit it. Everyone thought of Cecily Harper as a self-sufficient woman who had lots of friends and admirers. And no one realized that Cecily rarely met her friends. Her admirers even rarer. Well done, woman. Smart, beautiful. Lives for herself and in her own pleasure. Her friends adore her and men always after her, said her colleagues and acquaintances. And only those closest to her knew that Cecily was so lonely. Will you close it? Cecily turned to Abigail, who nodded eagerly. Cecily went outside. It was almost dark. There was no hurry, nothing but an unwashed breakfast cup and a cold bed with a book waiting for her at home. Cecily had once been married, but the marriage did not last long. The husband turned out to be a quiet alcoholic. Young and self-confident girl that Cecily was, without thinking twice, she quickly divorced and rushed into a new relationship. But whether fate punished her or she was just unlucky, all subsequent relationships fell apart before they even reached marriage. Cecily decided that fate would take care of her, so she decided to take the career route. She was much luckier than that, and in those few years, the woman became the CEO and co-owner of a large enterprise. She passionately mastered the new position, devoting all of herself to the enterprise that had become so important to her. At one of her friend's birthday parties, one of the guests paid attention to her. He was already quite drunk, and to his awkward attempts to flirt with Cecily, she responded only with a contemptuous smile. This did not please the unsuccessful suitor, and he said loudly, What are you showing off? Yeah, you're 40 soon, and you're still making someone of yourself. Who needs you, you old woman? You don't even have a cat. They don't stay with you because you're arrogant and narcissistic. There was a deadly silence. The guest waited to see what Cecily would say. The woman stared through the speaker and turned to the celebrant. Clifford, you didn't tell me you were having a birthday party for charity. Please clarify. Do they only feed the underprivileged here for free, or do I have to give some extra money? The flushed birthday boy mumbled, I'm sorry, Cecily, and quickly walked over to the confused man and ushered him out of the room. With a relaxed smile, Cecily took the champagne glass. Only at home, the smile was replaced by a mask of despair. Indeed, she was 40 and lonely. She has nothing and no one but her work, not even a cat. All of her friends were married and had children a long time ago, some more than once. And she, when was the last time she was on a date? Cecily spent the next year trying to meet a man, a beautiful woman, and moreover, the director of a large enterprise was popular, but after a few dates, or even right away, the woman realized that a serious relationship was not the point. They just wanted to use her as a mistress, as a purse, as a director. In desperation, she waved her hand and once again dove into work. Cecily walked home slowly. Her legs fiercely resisted, but there was no way out. There was no reason to go to the store, no reason to go to the movies, and no reason to go for a walk. God, Cecily mentally pleaded, send me a man at least, a simple worker, even with bad habits. But not too bad, said the woman, but sincere and unselfish. Someone who loved me for nothing, not my looks or money. The concierge nodded her head politely in greetings to Cecily. But her face seemed troubled to Cecily. Don't make it up, she reproached herself. The key still wouldn't go in the lock. Cecily lowered her hands and sighed deeply. Nerves. Suddenly, in the corner behind the garbage chute, there was some sort of crushing sound, and then another. Who's there? Cecily tried to speak as strictly as possible. Silence. Curiosity overcame fear, and the woman headed toward the garbage chute. Behind it, to her surprise, she found a pile of rags. Oh, wow. Maybe one of the tenants left it behind. But this is a nice house, and none of the neighbors have ever done anything like this. Cecily was mentally indignant. Suddenly, the pile moved and made the same sound again. The woman jumped back in fright. Could it be rats? But from where? 
She was about to call the concierge to immediately call for some kind of service to destroy these creatures. But suddenly, the pile squeaked. Please don't! And in a couple of seconds, the pile was transformed into a small, scruffy, raggedly dressed child. He looked at Cecily pitifully and coughed into a dirty fist. Who are you? Gary. How did you get here? Your concierge let me stay the night. It's cold outside. So you're a... you're a homeless guy? Yes. Cecily looked at the boy in silence. He looked about three years old, but it was clear from his conversation that he was older. Though, Cecily grinned bitterly, the street speeds up growing up. You know what? She said unexpectedly to herself. Let's go back to my place. No, thank you. I don't want to bother you. You're not disturbing me. I live alone. And why is she telling all this to a boy she doesn't even know and a street kid? I'll feed you. Are you hungry? Gary's eyes sparkled happily and he nodded his head. No, that won't work, Cecily said, looking at the boy in her house. He was filthy and smelled disgusting. Let's get you washed first. Can you do that? Gary nodded uncertainly. I see. Go into the bathroom. How old are you? Cecily asked, washing the boy again. Five, I guess, he said uncertainly. So you don't even remember being on the street? No. After feeding and putting the boy to bed, Cecily wondered if she could just say goodbye to him tomorrow. He's a child, and he needs a home. Without thinking twice, she dialed the number of an old friend who worked for the police. Apologizing for the late call, she described the situation. Maybe there's something we can do to find his parents, she concluded by asking. Even if we do find them, they'll probably be homeless people, the friend replied, yawning frantically. Don't bother, Cecily. Kids like that get used to everything from childhood. The woman looked at the silence tube and could not believe that people can be so callous. No way! She wouldn't let that child sleep outside one more night. Cecily was determined to save Gary. But the morning, her plans changed. When she went over to tell the boy that she was leaving and would not be in until the evening, she found him with a fever. Yesterday's muffled cough become eerily thunderous. Cecily scurried around the room, not knowing what to do. Remembering that a doctor lived above her, she rushed to him. Dr. John Bishop, help! She almost forcefully dragged the doctor into her apartment. Cecily, where did you get the baby? He wondered. Don't ask, help! John sighed and began to examine the boy. As far as I can tell, he has pneumonia. You need to get him to a hospital right away. I can't take him to a hospital? Cecily pleaded and spoke briefly of the baby's emergence. Well, the doctor shook his head. With a strange look at Cecily, I'll write you a prescription, but you'll need injections. Can you handle that? Yes, sure, the woman nodded. I used to do it for my dad. That's great. An hour later, Cecily rushed to the pharmacy, having called in sick, which surprised Abigail. The receptionist could not imagine that her boss could be sick and not come to work. Cecily, will you cure me and send me back out on the street? The question was asked so quietly that Cecily didn't understand it at first. It had been two weeks since she had found Gary. For a whole week, she had struggled to keep him healthy. And then, when he was recovering, she enjoyed spending time with him, reading him books, playing with him, cooking for him, even buying him new clothes. She was so used to him that she did not even think about the future. What? The woman looked up from the book she was reading aloud to Gary. I'm a complete stranger to you, aren't I? Gary stared at the boy for a long moment, a large lump in her throat stopping her from speaking. And it was true. She wouldn't be able to leave him. She had grown too fond of him and loved him too much. Come on, my boy. She held the child close to her. I will be only glad if you stay with me. Cecily gazed excitedly into the crowd of children. Lesson had ended about 20 minutes ago and Gary still wasn't there. It was the 1st of September and the boy was excited that he kept holding her hand. And when the teacher led the children to class, he kept looking back at her. For a whole year, Cecily fought for her boy, knocking on doors of various instances. Why do you need him? He grew up on the street. You don't know what you can expect from him. The women and men in charge of child's rights told her, Let's put him in an orphanage. He will be happy there. But Cecily was determined, and finally, the bureaucratic machine gave in. She became Gary's custodian. That day, he called her mother for the first time and looked at her frightened. My darling! Cecily cradled him in tears. What a good boy you are. I was so afraid to ask you to do it myself. The schoolyard was getting empty. 
A man stood beside Cecily, as anxious as she was. They looked at each other. The lady, The man turned to her and smiled. Yes, Cecily smiled back, surprised that a man could have such a kind and sincere smile. At that moment, Gary appeared from the school door, but not alone. Walking with him by the hand was a little girl with huge white bows. Mom, sorry I'm late, said Gary, walking with the girl towards her. Anise lost her trinket. I helped her look for it. I see your son is a real gentleman, the man standing nearby said. Thank you, young man, for helping my bewildered little girl find her keychain. I, Gary. The boy held out his hand to the man with a serious look. Felix. He introduced himself just as seriously. Mommy, I'd like you to meet... Gary turned to Cecily. This is Anise and her daddy Felix. Then he turned to the man. Felix, this is my mother Cecily. It's a pleasure. Felix nodded seriously, but Cecily could see the sparkle of laughter in his eyes. What beautiful bows you have. Cecily decided to keep the conversation going. Did your mother buy them for you? Dad, said Anise, and suddenly she was sad. Mom passed away two years ago, Felix explained quietly. Oh, I'm sorry. Cecily felt terribly ashamed of her tactlessness. She should have known that if a girl came to the big day with her father, it meant that her mother was in trouble. Don't be sad, Anise. Gary put his arm around her shoulders. I had no parents at all until Cecily found me. The girl and her father stared at Cecily in bewilderment. It's a long story, the woman smiled. We don't mind listening to it. Somewhere in a cafe with ice cream, wouldn't you, Anise? Felix smiled at Cecily again. Yes, the children howled happily, and the man looked at Cecily expectantly. Good, she smiled. Felix's smile made her feel embarrassed and lose her restraint. 